So my name is Ellen Broen. Um, and like Nick said, I studied abroad in Paris last er, two years ago in spring of 2011 through Misefa and Accent. Um, and I recently graduated from the University of Richmond. And I lived between L'Opéra and Sacré-Cœur in this beautiful part of the city. I had no idea who Meyer beer was. Um, and I didn't really pay much attention. I just noticed that it was this grand boulevard that led from my apartment down to the Grand Opera House. But we'll come back to that. I have the opportunity today to present to you not only my story in Paris, but um, a fascinating story full of intrigue and betrayal that I can tell you today. I will walk you through how I came to find what I did and um, what this story means not only to me, but I think to us as historians, as opera singers, as educators. So my research and topic began with the help of our music librarian at the University of Richmond, Dr. Linda Fairtile, who helped me find a way to converge all three majors into one thesis, believe it or not. Um, I came across an opera in French about its colonization of Africa. And who was it by? But Giacomo Meyerbeer, the guy from the street sign. So my first question was, who is this guy? And as a music major, why don't I know who he is? I'll first tell you who he was when he was alive. Um, and that'll make sense later. But I'll take you through how he was received and perceived while he was alive and um, what became of that. So when he was alive, he was absolutely beloved. He was born in 1791 and died in 1864, born Jakob Liebmann Meyerbeer into a wealthy family of Jewish German bankers. Now remember those three components because they'll come in handy later. Um, he grew up with a taste and a talent for music and it was apparent from day one that he would live a life full of music. Uh, by age 11, he was a piano prodigy, and with his talent and the wealth that his family possessed, he was able to study with some of the best teachers in Europe, including in Italy. And it was in Italy that he discovered this new talent for composing. And there he would compose six very successful operas that would earn him the title of leading Italian composer, opera composer since Rossini. At this juncture, he decided to change his name from Jacob to Giacomo, the Italian form of his name, to not only recognize what gift Italy had given him in his you know, pursuit of music and um, just a passion, but also his multinational identity that would become so iconic for Meyerbeer. He combined his German background in instrumental music and piano music with this newfound um, Italian operatic style of composition called bel canto, and this new fascination with a lyrical, fluid French melody that was so iconic of the time, and came to form an entire new genre of opera called grand opera. Now just to give you a little bit of context, um, grand opera is so significant because, um, first of all, it dealt generally in historical context or specific historical events, but more importantly, it targeted new audiences. During this time, France and many other countries in Europe were um, entertaining a lot of revolutionary causes and um, just change was abundant. So this new upwardly mobile middle class, the bourgeoisie, started appearing at the Opera House, which had originally been a very arist aristocratic um, venue. And so to cater to these new audiences, he ch Meyerbeer almost single-handedly changed what that experience was at the opera house. We opera singers like to call the pre-Meyerbeer time park and bark, where you just stand and sing as loud as possible. But he made it this larger-than-life experience where sets, grand sets, and costume changes, and acting, and makeup, and just this full experience um, came to life in the op on the opera stage. And finally, he musically defied interesting boundaries with these things called light motifs, where a small melody would signify or reference a person. So we all know, dunum, 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 dunum. What are we all thinking of? Jaws. So that's exactly what a light motif is. It's just a small musical idea that will reference a person or a character that's used kind of like a literary technique for foreshadowing or alluding. So all of this came out of grand opera from Meyerbeer and became known as the art of the future. I found my greatest interest in his last opera called L'Africaine, mostly because it just touched on all three of my majors. So 
this opera was set during Vasco da Gama's expedition from um, Portugal around the Cape of Good Hope up to India, where he didn't ever actually end up in India, but we won't go there. Um, and it dealt with um, you know, very rich subjects like exoticism and colonialism, gender, race representation, linguistic nuances. I could go on forever. Um, and it's a fascinating opera that surprisingly had very little scholarship on it. When I had quickly drained my French university's library and the virtual databases available through the University of Richmond, I moved my research to the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, or the BNF. It was here that I uncovered a story that was even more fascinating than, one, than the one that I had set out to find. By immersing myself in these primary resources, which were covered in dust and I had to cover uh, or use gloves to just touch the pages, what I thought was an enormous hurdle that I encountered actually turned into my research question. So source after source, I read one conflicting opinion after the other about who Meyerbeer was and how his music was received and perceived by his audiences. So while he was alive, like I said, he was beloved, idolized, successful. His operas were played all over the, all over the world. Um, and his critics just raved about how artistic and beautiful, with a capital B, everything was. And then it was as if a switch was flipped after he died, where um, suddenly he was this villainous figure in music history who had tried to um, basically hypnotize his audiences into this vapid stupor of entertaining but, you know, soulless music. Um, and suddenly his wealth and his Jewishness and um, his multinational identity became problems. So this image of a charlatan out to deceive the world and um, really a mark on, the, on music history itself was the image that stayed um, from his death onward until today. And so my new research question was, why? I mean, wh was he in fact bribing his way through his career to, while he was alive and then when he died they found him out? Or was there something else going on? And that brings me to Richard Wagner. By the time Meyerbeer was famous and just beloved, like I was telling you, um, a young man that was German um, was just brimming with talent and ambition with um, a huge interest in Meyerbeer. Driven by the idea that he was destined, put on this earth, to become one of the great composers of all times, he yearned to get to Paris and to have his operas on stage, and who better to help him get there but Meyerbeer, who was German, who was successful, who was driven. Um, so Wagner gets up all the gall he could possibly have and follows Meyerbeer to his summer home in France, um, armed with scores, and plays them for him. Now, whether he was wooed by his gall or his gift, who knows, but Meyerbeer loved Wagner's um, talent and charisma, and he took him under his wing and said, I'll, I'll help you in any way I can. So that would materialize into decades of a very intimate uh, mentor-mentee relationship over, over letters, um, as well as uh, financial support for him for several decades. Unfortunately, as anybody can testify for any beginning of a career, there were hurdles and speed bumps and you know things didn't go quite like Wagner wanted them or expected them to. And so the deeper into the friendship they got, the more paranoid and jealous and just a little unstable Wagner started to get, wondering why his music wasn't at the level Meyerbeer's was and what, you know, was it him? or was it Meyerbeer? He started suspecting Meyerbeer of sabotage and resented him for this um, long-standing relationship that seemed fairly fruitless. And so when the tension started building, of course, never mentioning anything to Meyerbeer, this is all in Wagner's head, Meyerbeer um, decides at a certain point to stop sending his finances to Wagner and says, you know, you've, you've really establ established yourself as a musician, Fly, my little bird. Um, and Wagner took that as quite an insult. He said he believed that this was just the ultimate um, evidence that Meyerbeer was just trying to sabotage him.
This anger came to surface. Wagner doesn't approach Meyerbeer. He publishes these very infamous papers in 1849 that would forever change their relationship for the rest of Meyerbeer's life, um, as well as Meyerbeer's historical legacy and identity as we know it today. These papers were called Opera and Drama, Art and Revolution, and the most venomous, Judaism in Music. With, if you take into context who he was targeting, which was Meyerbeer, it comes out in a very different light. So broadly, he was purporting that Jews had calculatedly taken over society through its most influential institutions, being the media and newspapers and public opinion and banks. Need I remind you that Meyerbeer's father was a Jewish banker. Um, he also latches on to the nationalistic German folk idea where um, you were born into this folk and you were the God's people on earth that um, were the only true understanders and believers in truth with a capital T and beauty with a capital B. Um, and anybody that pretended to be one within the folk was, should be shunned and forgotten. And in the case of Meyerbeer, his Jewishness invalidated naturally his German heritage, so he was out of the Volk. And um, his multinational identity being Monsieur Giacomo Meyerbeer, so a French, Italian, and German man, named man, um, had spurned Germany and insulted it. So not only should he be shunned in life, but he should be forgotten in history. And finally, he attacks his music, with coining a phrase called effect without cause, um, essentially meaning that his, uh, his music was not art. It was entertainment and just a facade. Um, nothing more than a bunch of notes that entertained and didn't speak to the soul. So during Meyerbeer's lifetime, these essays were received for the most part as what they were, which are the rantings of a slightly unstable, bitter nationalist. And Meyerbeer's reputation as a man stayed fairly intact. But after his death, they would gain more repute, and without Meyerbeer or friends of Meyerbeer to attest that these are just absurd, um, they started, and while Wagner's reputation started rising, he started gaining credit for what he said, and this became a source for um, scholarship on who Meyerbeer was. Scholarship latch on, latched onto this picture of Meyerbeer and remained stagnant for over a century and a half until the late 1990s in textbooks that I used in my music history class. So sinking into obscurity, these operas were never played, or when they were, they were taken from four hours to an hour and a half to make it more palatable for a larger audience to come to this unknown composer's opera. So the shallowness that was associated with his music, um, or you know that, that he didn't carry through his melodic idea and speak to the soul was because it was chopped up piecemeal like representations of what he actually wrote. In no other opera was this as glaringly evident in my research than L'Africaine. The role of Meyerbeer's critics was obviously devastating to his historical legacy and his musical representation, but in L'Africaine, the hand of the critic was even more disturbingly meddling. I told you that L'Africaine was written right before he died, but what I didn't tell you was that it was edited immediately after he died. His wife decided to pass along the opera to a family friend to edit and prepare last minute changes for the stage. He was not only not a composer, but in fact a music critic. So in the hands of his critics, um, embedded in his score, on the stage, and in academia, Meyerbeer, the man and his music, have been misrepresented for far too long. So what we have left with these personal vendettas and social filters of anti-Semitism and nationalism and just regurgitated misinformation is this obscure, absurd picture of who this man really was. Even far more insidious was, in fact, my talks with other opera singers when I asked them, um, you know, we've all studied from the same textbook, so when I asked them, who is Meyerbeer, and do, do you ever sing him? Like, do you like him? All of their responses were, oh, you know, his music's kind of cliche, and um, just, he's like a wannabe Wagner. So my aim today, quite simply, and through this paper that I um, hope to publish, would be 
just to give him back what was deservedly his, his story in history. And through that, I hope to give him back his music. And whatever it takes, if I have to write 18 papers or if I have to stand in front of the Metropolitan Opera and sing an entire opera alone, I want his music to be played entirely and his image to be restored. And the, for the world to remember Giacomo Meyerbeer for who he really was and to listen with new ears.